Hello, Mountain Bikers, Matt from Singletracks.com, and today we have another video for you We're talking about coil shocks, more specifically using a coil shock on your trail bike. We'll talk a little bit about the pros of using a coil shock on your trail bike, the cons, and towards the end we're going to talk a little bit about how to set them up. So by now you've probably seen some buzz about coil shocks on trail bikes, enduro bikes, uh, at least over the past year or two. Push Industries has been a popular one for a while, uh, but now in the past year or two, two other brands like MRP, theirs is new, uh, Rock Shocks recently just came out with more sizes for their Vivid on trail and enduro bikes, and now we have this new one from Marzocchi. Until their gain in popularity or their resurgence in the past few years, uh, they're mostly seen on downhill bikes, and that's because the benefits are primarily had on descending. Small bump compliance is the biggest noticeable change that you'll see when switching from an air to a coil shock. Marzocchi sent over their new Bomber CR uh, to check out back in December, and I've been riding it a little bit, at least when the trails are not snowy, and it's turned me into somewhat of a believer in using a coil shock on trail bikes. It's something that's hard to describe or validate unless you've really gotten some time in on a coil shock. But without the air or friction or seals present that are in an air shock, the small bump performance is definitely noticeable within using a coil shock. The result is better traction, uh, it's better performance over high speed bumps, over small bumps, over rock gardens, high speed rock gardens, corners, really chundery loose terrain. I felt that overall my bike tracked better and made me confident in all those areas of terrain where I normally would have felt a little bit more sketched out about hitting them at speed on full air suspension. There is a downside though, coil shocks are heavier. Uh, the shock alone is generally maybe a pound heavier than a regular air shock. Initially, they can be a little bit tougher to set up and tune, and you can also lose some climbing efficiency. So with that in mind, they're not going to be for everyone. On top of the extra weight, I felt like I lost a little bit of climbing snap in my pedal efficiency as well. This one doesn't have a climb switch. There's a lot of coil shock options out there that do. I was able to find a sweet spot in my low speed compression and rebound and with the preload adjust to find a one size fits all setting for climbing and descending. It's also going to be important that you have a progressive suspension linkage on your trail bike. Um, nowadays I feel like most trail bikes do, um, you know if we're talking about a trail bike we're probably talking in between 130 and 170 millimeters. Um, most of those are going to be pretty progressive it seems by these days, but since you're losing the progressivity of an air can and going to a more linear feeling coil shock, uh, you don't want a very linear suspension platform that's going to make you mush through all your suspension. MRP is actually uh, producing progressive coils now, so uh, I believe the way it works is the coil is a little bit thicker towards the end, so that way you kind of get that more progressive feel out of a coil. Uh, but it's certainly a little bit more expensive than going out there and just popping a volume spacer in an air can. And with that, by switching to a coil shock, finding the right spring rate is going to be important also. You're going to want to check out spring calculators online, make sure you find the right one for your weight. I started out with a 450 pound spring uh, and I found that I had to crank on the preload adjuster too much to set the sag right and that's not really something you want to do. So I ended up bumping up to a 500 pound spring and that firmed things up for me a little bit. I didn't have to use the preload adjuster as much to find the right sag for me. So finding the right spring is going to be really, really important in switching to a coil shock as well. But if you're still convinced, we're going to give you a little bit of help uh, on how to set your coil shock up. As mentioned, you'll want to refer to a spring calculator online uh, and that can be a little bit experimental as well. Like I said, I was right in between a 450 and 500 pound spring, so I had to try them both out to make sure I was getting the right one. That said, uh, springs like this for the Marzocchi are only 30 bucks. Uh, $30 to start for a spring is it's not going to be a terrible cost to, to burden. So when you have your spring and your shock, you're going to want to mount them up. First, you're going to notice there's going to be a little bit of play in that spring and the shock, and that's why you want to use the preload adjuster to tighten down. But excessively tightening the preload adjuster is not recommended for getting the sag right. Different manufacturers are going to have different recommendations on how much they want you to turn the preload adjuster. Some are going to say only two full turns, some are going to say only four or five. That's something you want to check on your user manual when you get a coil shock. If you find out that you have to turn the preload adjuster like a ballerina in order to get your sag right, then it's time just to move up a spring. By not getting that spring right, it's going to feel mushy, you're going to see more bottom outs, and that's not what you want. So why don't you want to just crank up the preload to get the sag right? Well, with 
a greater preload like that uh, comes a greater force needed for the shock to start working initially. So when it comes to setting up a coil shock, you'll need a partner, a wall, or something to stabilize yourself and the bike. You also need to know your shock's eye to eye length and the stroke length, which you should have already if you've ordered one. On top of that, you're going to want to find your sag rate for your bike. Do this by checking their website, looking in owner's manual. Mine was 28%. So just like you'd set up an air shock, you want to get all your riding gear on, make sure that you have your pack, your fanny pack, your shoes and your helmet and all that on, uh, because the weight's just going to be like setting up a, an air shock in that regard. If your coil shock has an open mode, set it to open mode. That's where you want to be at when you're setting your sag. So with your riding gear on, hop up on the bike, uh, and your partner's going to come down, they're going to measure the eye to eye length on that shock. When we're talking eye to eye, we're talking from here to here. We're saying eye to eye, but really we're measuring the stroke length and the sag amount against the stroke length. For my shock, 28% of 57 millimeters, which is the stroke length, it comes out to about 16 millimeters. So for mine, it's about 16 millimeters, and really we're looking for about a 16 millimeter compression from here to here in the shock. After that, the sag should be ready to go. So you'll need to get it out on the trail and tune it some more to find your desired settings. So there you have it. That's most of what you should need to know about using a coil shock on a trail bike. Now you can let us know. Did you like using a coil shock on your trail bike? Did you like the benefits? Were the cons worth it? Did you find the extra weight worth it? Was it hard to set up? Let us know down in the comments. For more information, daily news, and everything mountain biking, visit singletracks.com. Most importantly, have fun out there, and we'll see you on the trails.